Yeah. There's there's a pervasive problem across all sports right now with early specialization, you know, and it's impacting sport participation, you know, the athlete's experience, and it's ultimately inhibiting, you know, the athlete's career performance. Mm -hmm. So the conversation all sports is having is how do we prevent that? And luckily, Mike and I are part of the conversation with U.S. Sailing um, to help, you know, translate that message specifically for our sport. Welcome back to Powering Performance, brought to you by Bridge Athletic. I'm your host, Maya Monell, and today I'm so excited to be here with two coaches revolutionizing the professional sailing space. Fred Strammer, Mike Kushner, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Maya. Yeah. All right, guys. I typically like to start things off here by really just allowing the audience to hear a brief about yourselves, your backgrounds, how you two met in the first place, and and a little bit about what you're doing, and we'll get into the the ins and outs of that later in the show. Sounds great. Yeah. Well, you know, Mike and I have been involved with sailing our whole lives, and we met uh, while we were Olympic campaigning, and we teamed up a bit for the 2016 Olympic trials, sailing the men's 49er. Um, and it was mm -hmm. uh, upon retiring from Olympic sailing that we were looking back at our experiences, and we wanted, you know... We wanted to basically take what we had learned and um, our, have all those experiences and build something that could help make the next generation of athletes better. So, mm -hmm. you know, sailing's a unique sport in that uh, the we don't have a conventional um, athlete development pathway. Um, the sailing development pathway is unique in that there's no physical, nutritional, or cognitive education uh, throughout the athlete's tenure. Um, so the athlete kind of has to either, there's some really good coaches that the ac athlete will be exposed to and they learn some of those skills along the way, or they almost have to go seek those skills from outside resources or from playing, uh, with other sports. Um, so, you know, Mike and I, looking back at our experiences, we said, you know, there were a lot of non-sailing skills that we wish we had developed and were better at that would have probably made a difference in how, we campaigned for the Olympics. And so we developed sailing performance training. You know, Mike had been working on this idea, um, developing kind of like the curriculum and how this could work from a strength conditioning perspective. And, you know, I've been thinking about how this could happen from a business standpoint. And we teamed up a year or two after our Olympic experience together and, and founded this company. So we're completely remote. Um, we have a team of strength and conditioning, nutrition, and soon psychology coaches. And the goal is to provide access to all these experts in a very sailing specific way, um, which is unique because not very many people are familiar with our sport. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Fred, thanks for, for the intro, Mike. Uh, I, do you have anything to add? I feel like Fred yeah, <laughs> kind of gave the rundown there. Uh, really looking forward to kind of diving into some absolutely. of those topics. Absolutely. Yeah. No, you know, looking back at our career, we, we have the special opportunity that we we're able to both be the athletes in our career mm -hmm. and the coaches. Mm -hmm. And I think that transition from athlete to coach has been a very rewarding experience for both of us. And, um, you know, as a result, that, that really allowed us to, to, to see the athlete really where, where they are and, and what their process is and kind of have a, a different level of understanding of, of how to uh, help them through their career at, at all the stages. And, you know, it's our goal at Sailing Performance Training to really, uh, you know, build that pathway for the athlete. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited. It's a new, it's a new world for us to be in on the coaching realm, um, and on a business realm as well. And, you know, we're really enjoying that process, uh, as we mm -hmm. learn more and more. 
And you both mentioned that you, you've got a staff behind you. I'm curious. I, you know, we, I know we work very closely here at Bridge together, but Mike, are you kind of leading the performance arm? Fred, are you kind of directing the ops? What's your, I guess, play within the organization? How are you hiring new members? What does the organization structure really look like? Yeah, so, you know, Fred and I co-own the business together. Um, mm-hmm. I take most of the performance side of the the business. So working and managing with our other strength and conditioning coaches that we have on staff. So right now, including myself, we have three strength and conditioning coaches. And um, we foresee that growing to somewhere in the eight to 10 coach range. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have a uh, high performance nutritionist, we call her. So she is a, a contractor within our business. Um, all of our coaches are contractors at the moment. And um, what that allows us to do at a, at a higher end service for our athletes is is get high performance coaches at a, at a relatively reasonable cost, um, but really working together as a team. So I, myself as the performance coach, strength and conditioning, conditioning coach, um, really work in closely in hand with the nutritionist, with any psychologist, with any um, team leader, sailing coach. So the, the whole dynamic of the coaches is, is really an uh, important aspect to um, doing the remote side of coaching very effectively. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting and I'm definitely looking forward to diving into the psychological component. I hadn't realized that you all were about to to dive into that realm as well, but there's certainly a lot to be said that both at the youth level and the the pro level at which I know you're both working with those different types of athletes. And that's what I want to turn to now, uh, talking a bit more about, you know, the different, the variety of athletes that you train or, you know, you focused on one particular space. Will you take a novice, say myself, as well as Mike, uh, go for know, the pro Olympic space? Yeah, absolutely. So as an Olympic campaigner ourselves, um, really the, the first athletes that we had as a, as a company, uh, you know, I was basically helping my other teammates and other sailors within the Olympic realm that were uh, in the same circuit that we were traveling with them, um, more hands-on approach of helping them on a one-to-one basis. Uh, And then from that, it started to grow into, okay, different uh, national governing bodies around the world. Some athletes expressed interest at that Olympic scene. So we really started at the elite level of coaching athletes and then from there, we've recognized, uh, you know, some of the deficiencies that have been coming up that are quite frequent at the Olympic level. You know, I started to ask myself, well, what if we had these athletes 10 years before where they are right now? And what, what, what would be some of the things that we could start to do with those athletes that once they get to the Olympic level, they have a better opportunity and a better chance to succeed? So that brought us into um, more of the youth coaching and we're working with the Olympic Mm -hmm. development team for sailing uh, and and helping them kind of raise that next generation of uh, high performance racing sailing athletes. Um, And then from there, we're working with, you know, all the way down to just the U.S. sailing youth programs uh, around the nation and and really helping to create a curriculum and education that will uh, enhance their physical literacy and enhance their chance to be able to do sport however they wish to do it when they grow up. Um, So we have a wide range and, and the sport of sailing is it's a lifelong sport, as we always say. So I think our oldest mm-hmm. client is 60, 62. Um, so we have a wide range, you know, any for anywhere from 12 to, to, you know, into your sixties. And, and for, for us, it's how can we help each individual athlete succeed and, and be fulfilled at what they're doing for their career, whether it's sailing or it's sailing is just a hobby. Um, we, we help each athlete kind of achieve their goals. Mm-hmm. And I, I do want to take some time later on in the episode too to talk about how you guys did develop your business model, how you're targeting different markets. Because I do think it's really interesting that you know you have this 100% remote um, operation, and from at least the the different organizations like you that I've encountered, uh, that is very unique. 
to operate completely remotely from, from any athlete. Um, so I do want to take time to talk about kind of how you've attacked the market and you've done so well in doing so and kind of compelling, creating this compelling message around why it's so important to offer this type of training to this, to sailing. Um, but at first I want to talk about that remote in its most complex piece, which is how you actually monitor, evaluate, train those segments. Um, so I want to talk a bit more about kind of your process, like week to week, how are you keeping track of that, you know, 60 some odd year old and, and the youth athlete, you know, how are you training them? What are you looking for? Do you see a lot of, um, similarities, even if it's a a mixed kind of population of, of sailors, what, what's your game plan? Yeah. Well, the, the biotech world is, is amazing right now. Um, the, you know, bridge tracker (laughs) has helped us out a ton. This wouldn't be possible without it. Right. Um, both from delivering the programs that we, we, we need to, for our athletes and also to communicate with them, uh, either within the app or um, we also connect with them, um, you know, for our younger athletes using text messages or WhatsApp and then uh, our older athletes using email. Um, but all of our athletes utilize the Bridge Tracker app and that communication, that team stream there. Um, and then we also complement that with video conferencing uh, each month in order to help bridge um, mm-hmm. that remoteness uh, to connect with them a bit more. And of course, we all of that's um, backed by a separate athlete data management platform, SmarterBase, that helps to build reports and monitor the athlete a bit further and also uh, it handles a bit of the notifications and messaging. Mm-hmm. And about the communication component, I have a lot of coaches constantly talk to me about, you know, if they want to grow their, say, their personal side of the business, or if they frankly want to just communicate, you know, so many strength coaches are the only folks that can, coaches rather, that can communicate with athletes when we look at like, you know, the collegiate space, for instance. Um, How are you all establishing a human connection, especially with people that, again, so many that you've never actually met in person? How are you kind of creating that buy-in? Well, what's interesting is the sailing world is very small, and Mike and I actually have met a lot of the athletes that we're working with, and we have really strong connections, um, either maybe not directly with that athlete, but maybe with that athlete's older brother or a fellow teammate or their coach. So um, Mike and I have a great you know, amount of time in the sport, and we've developed our own reputations, which has, I think, helped us out a ton. Um, so admit that makes it a lot easier for sure. And, you know, do you all also establish some kind of relationship with the coach up front? So say you, you do know the athlete, you've gotten connected with them, but what about the actual, actual sailing coach? What's kind of that environment look like? I think a lot of our, our listeners might like myself be, be less, uh, knowledgeable about the sailing space. And so maybe if you can map out who are the different stakeholders in the process. Yeah. I, I mean, the sailing coaches are integral in that, and uh, we want them to be a part of the whole process. Um, and same thing with the parents. So particularly for our younger athletes, we want the parents to be involved with everything from the initial onboarding um, through the consults. We want them there if they're able to attend the video conferencing. Um, and we want to set up a model where we're communicating often with the sailing coach because we believe the sailing coach is driving a lot of the compliance and they're driving a lot of, um, you know, the athletes will during practice to succeed. So if the coach says like, you are unable to perform this movement on the water, um, and that's related to either fitness or nutrition, um, then they're giving us, you know, feedback and also, um, positive reinforcement for what we're doing. And the coach can, you know, lean on us for for additional information and how to help that athlete achieve that movement. And mm-hmm. same with the athlete, they can reach out to us and know that they have, you know, our, our hope was there was a team of coaches, you know, performance team um, around every sailing athlete um, that would help them succeed throughout their whole athletic development. Mm-hmm. And from a, from a remote side as well for, for coaching, you know, the, the athlete coach relationship is tremendously important and not having that, 
tactile uh, ability to to either help cue in movements as well mm-hmm. as um, kind of the the eye to eye communication or you know basically just have that sense about the athlete of what they're going through what their process is what they're struggling with um, that's a major limitation in remote coaching and so what we really have to do well as coaches is to gain a, a tremendous amount of trust with each of our athletes and really dig deep in terms of uh, the lifestyle component of coaching so we understand what they're going through on a day-to-day basis. You know, we can't tell if they're tired. We can't tell if they're, um, you know, fatigued just by looking at them. So we have to use one data, so biometrics that we track on a daily basis to understand if they've, they've slept well, how long, what their hydration status is kind of an overall athlete readiness score that we can put on them to just make sure that we're continuing to monitor what, what they're doing and, and how they're performing, whether they're adapting to the program or not. And then, you know, from there, it's, it's that monthly consultation that we have with the athlete where it is one-on-one and face-to-face and you get to know what their schedule's like, where they're traveling to, touch on their priorities. Are they enjoying it? Are, do they know the reason why they're doing what they're doing? Um, really going to a deeper level with each of these athletes in a remote setting is critically important because just giving a program to do strength and conditioning is not going to allow that athlete to succeed at, at the highest level. Yeah. And I mean, certainly, you know, the, the stakes are much greater, right? Because they're actually competing for something, right? Rather than, you know, kind of your traditional, just average Joe training to, to stay in shape. Certainly the st- stakes are great there and can be. But, um, you know, I think in terms of accountability, we often talk about accountability, especially within a r- remote model and how you all, you, know, you have those monthly meetings, how you all keep everybody honest. Um, and I wonder if you even have that challenge, you know, because you are dealing with athletes uh, with a with a great purpose, right? With a with a goal set in mind from the beginning. Um, do you often have to have the conversation of because they come to you of, of why this kind of training is important? Yeah, yeah, we definitely do. I mean, that that's that's a part of every coach athlete relationship and, and being remote is, is that mm-hmm. much more challenging to keep accountability. Um, what mm-hmm. we found foremost to be, to be the foremost helpful is, is a high performance plan that we create. So by getting the athlete schedule, whether it's 12 months ahead of time, 18 months, 24 months, maybe their Olympic career is 2028 in, in Los Angeles, right? That's a big one for us in the United States. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of those youth athletes, we need to understand what their long-term plan is and then put like based on where they assess and, and what their starting line is, what their baseline is, we're able to put mm-hmm. a long term progression of where they should be and what they should be working on for both them and their sailing coach. And I've found 99 percent of the time, if I can show that long term plan for an athlete and help them mm-hmm. understand where they are within that long term plan then we're way more likely to succeed and the accountability goes through the roof because they know what they're doing and the reasons why they're doing it. Um, Often accountability reasons that athletes um, wouldn't be compliant with the work are likely is because they don't know the intent of it or they don't know a reason why they're doing it, especially in a different sport where it's not strength and conditioning is not the norm. Um, so we really have to mm-hmm. paint that picture for the athlete and really show and walk mm-hmm. that athlete through why, why they're mm-hmm. doing what they're doing. And, you know, I'm also curious and, and, uh, as we talk more about kind of the sailing specific athlete, um, you know, what are some of the unique aspects of the sailing season? I mean, are there anything that you know, might not come to mind for maybe a, a younger coach getting, having to train, say, you know, a collegiate level sailor or something that, you know, for the sport that they're not actually familiar with? Yeah, for sure. It's the, what's super unique about sailing is the amount of traveling that our athletes do. Um, you know, our professional athletes um, are on the road either, I mean, they're probably sailing 200 to 300 days a year, and that doesn't include the travel to get to places. Um, and I know from Mike's and my experience, Olympic sailing, um, you know, we would basically go to Europe in the spring for 90 days or more. And it was just two weeks, four weeks at every venue, and then move on. So, 
you know, the challenge can be, um, you know, trying to make the athlete understand in the larger context of a multi-year plan, like what are the priorities? So helping to, you know, redirect their focus to say like, no, you don't need to go and sail every single regatta. In, right. in fact, you should spend more time and save more money by training at home. Um, so lending that experience and because both of us have been there, we have, um, we're great um authoritarians in that in that sense we can provide a lot of context for that um and then it, you know even with our athletes that need to travel it's trying to um complement and continue their plan mm -hmm. with without interruption so a lot of times our athletes travel to the same venues and so we have been building a database of the local gyms or like the kind of like the playbooks for how when you show up to this venue, you know, these are your priorities. Mm -hmm. This is your gym space, you know, based on your high performance plan, you know, is your priority going to be performance on the water? Or is it going to be a mix of both like you're going to sail this regatta, but it's also going to suck because you have to go and log that gym time, you know, so it's, it's the high performance plan for us has been one of the best ways to resolve a lot of these issues and both in getting compliance from the athlete and, uh, you know, resolving the remote uh, coaching issue, it's, it's been just in general, very, very helpful. And it sounds like too, having, I think you spoke a bit, a bit about this, both, both Mike and Fred, you did, um, about giving them the visualization of the plan up front. So it sounds like even certainly there are changes that happen within the performance plan, but, you know, especially as they go into an in-season, can they see, you know, at least I know on bridge you could, you could, but do you talk to them about the different stages of the plan that they're going to be working into many months before that happens? Um, it, and is that, has that helped as an engagement, uh, you know, kind of an engagement, I guess, tone as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we periodize all of our programming relative to their, main competitions through the mm -hmm. season. So, you know, mm -hmm. we have a, an accumulation phase where we're building volume. It's very high load, high, high volume. Uh, that's usually mm -hmm. in the off season or when they have uh, a few weeks where they can commit to that, whether they're both sailing on the water and gym training or just gym, gym training. We monitor both the load on the water and uh, in the gym to really make sure that we're complementing each other. And then that, yeah, every month we're talking about, okay, what were the priorities in the last month? What phase are we in? What's coming up? When's the next competition? And, uh, you know, how can we build towards that successfully? Um, what are the aspects of travel that you're going to anticipate? How do we switch time zones? Uh, we're very much, the, the whole conversation that we're having is about how to anticipate and prepare for what the, the competition is or uh, say a testing physical testing uh, environment. So, you know, from that, that builds a lot of, uh, you know, Hey, we're in this together. And I get a lot of feedback from them during each of these competitions in terms of what worked and what didn't work. Um, and we really build a program together where uh, it's most successful for that athlete because no one athlete is going to peak in the same way. Um, and no one athlete has the same schedule. So it really becomes an individualized program uh, for each one of our athletes. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, too, to hear, aside from the training regime, especially while they're traveling, what are your travel recommendations? I've been hearing everything, I think, under the sun from different coaches recently about, you know, uh, the tools, the tricks, um, the different you know, pillows and, and all the rest of it uh, that they that they tell their athletes to travel with. Have you guys found anything you have athletes to travel probably at the highest volume we've we've heard of um, or close to any tricks up the sleeve that can help an athlete recover from especially long haul travel? Yeah, the, the main thing that I look at as a performance coach is is what is their energy rhythm like on a day-to-day -day basis? Even before you travel, what is their, do they have a sense of what a circadian rhythm is? And where does that lie relative to the sun-moon cycle? So if we can look at their circadian rhythm and, and how they react to different, um, different either environmental or physical or nutritional intakes, uh, whether that be sugar, uh, lack of sleep, um, different climate, 
when we look at how that athlete reacts in those situations and what their baseline energy cycle is like, then we can really provide mm-hmm. a good um, context in terms of what's going to be important. Um, usually an athlete that has a well-balanced circadian rhythm will be able to switch time zones faster than somebody that is a uh, super night owl and can't can't have doesn't have any energy until noon um, works out at 9 p.m those sorts of things then we'll see those athletes struggle more when they switch time zones um, so it's it's a lot about how do you uh, biohack I don't really like that word but but how do you strategize uh, right. in terms of creating a good lifestyle and lifestyle characteristics that are going to be successful and resilient to any of the travel that you're doing. So we look at it on a broader scale. Um, and then we just try to reinforce, you know, what that athlete needs in terms of rest and recovery, um, before and after travel, before they can start compete, uh, before they start to compete. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, we can come up with generalizations on how to improve, uh, you know, performance after travel, but, I think one of the one of the key things that we're looking at, we're monitoring and we're tracking and hopefully going to have enough data to come up with better solutions for is, you know, how our athletes are reacting to travel. So with our athlete uh, management platform, we're gaining um, data on biofeedback while traveling. Um, and because these athletes travel so much, we're getting a lot of good data points and very quickly we'll be able to see kind of characteristics across, you know, all of our athletes, but then also be able to make recommendations very specifically to each athlete. Um, and I think that's, that's the key there because no two athletes are exactly the same. And, you know, just to say, you know, drink water or, you know, make sure you stretch in between flights may not be enough. Maybe it's more cognitive or maybe it's like the, the Delta cookies that they're, they're having on the flight or the couple of, you know, drinks, it's, you know, it's, it's quite unique. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, no, and I'm curious too, now that you all have been using an athlete management system, you, you said you referenced a smart base, obviously you're using bridge as well. Have you found any interesting correlations, especially the travel cycles, anything that you're seeing consistently across say demographic or across your different segments of athletes? In terms of travel, we haven't uh, broken the data down quite yet. Um, that's, that's the task ahead of us um, at the conclusion of this year. But um, I, uh, Mike's, yeah, Mike's definitely seen some interesting studies mm-hmm. on our collegiate athletes um, in terms of just general health mm-hmm. and, and sleep. Yeah. For, so, so for sleep, what we track is number of hours and then we can track mm-hmm. overall mood and uh, stress, muscle fatigue, muscle soreness uh, during those times. And, and so for our collegiate athlete, uh, I should know how many weekends out of the year, but, but fall and spring uh, until the national championship. Right. About 10, 10 in the fall, 12 in the spring. Right. So they, and they're usually traveling up to 10 hours in terms of one way car ride to go to another university right. and compete. So they're up late. Um, they don't get much sleep. They get back to their school usually like 2 a.m. on Sunday night and then have to go back to school on Monday. Uh, so that whole system is, is pretty demanding. And when we look at that, since it's consistent every weekend uh, for many weekends, what I've, I've run a study that just shows – uh, sleep as well as body weight and then overall systemic stress to the body, whether it be emotionally or or physically. And what we find Mm -hmm. is that there's almost a cycle of body weight increase during the weekend days, as well as systemic inflammation increase during the weekend days paired with lower sleep. And then during the week, they're able to recover uh, back for the next event. So there's so just in the aspect of lifestyle, travel, and management of travel, we're significantly lowering our athletes' potential during these college weekends, unless we can really find a good strategy for them in terms of how to how to maintain that. And like we said, that's both at a team level as well as a um, as well as a individual level for how each of those athletes will respond. But there, there's definitely correlations with lack of sleep, systemic stress, uh, inflammation, gut irritation, all those certain aspects are, are very common. And, and we see them uh, over trends of time with our athletes. Uh, and it's all about how do we manage those times best. And that's a lot of the conversation that we have. 
Well, and especially with student athletes, right? Because I mean, surely, yeah, they're they're in high stress situations or lack of sleep and all the rest of it from traveling to different regattas during the weekends. But they also have schoolwork during the week, which I can imagine is stressful. And even with your adult populations too, because it's not, you know, I don't, I, I guess a, a pro sailor might not be working another job or, or, or whatnot. But I mean, during the week, stressors can obviously impact overall performance. And if you get enough of those weeks that build on top of each other, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious too, and maybe that leads me into mitigating for injury in that realm. And I know everybody doesn't really like to talk about that, but you know, what are the kinds of deficiencies that you see in a sailor? Um, you know, that might lead us into the, the youth development conversation as well, but uh, how are you guys, you know, mitigating for injury again as a remote model, but also in a very unique sport? I can start that out. Um, so, you know, since we worked with we, and we still work with the U.S. Uh, Olympic team, the sailing team uh, at the highest level they're you know, they're ranging anywhere mm-hmm. from 22 to 35 in age. Uh, and the kind of age mm-hmm. is around that 30 to 35 in terms of Olympic medals. Um, but working with that population, you know, we really, what I've seen is that at least in the sport of sailing, where the sport requires very anterior dominant, uh, muscles to be in overdrive. Mm-hmm. So that's the, you know, the front of our body, the, the quads, the shins, the hip flexors, the psoas, um, the pecs, the biceps, all of those areas take a lot of demand in the sports, um, specific aspects. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, what we, what we see is that there's an imbalance in terms of uh, muscle use and overcompensation uh, within that anterior side. So what we've, what we've done and, and we assess all of our athletes to understand if they have a good baseline or not. Um, and what we see is that the athletes that I have at the Olympic level, if they were taught at a younger age, some physical literacy skills and balance out their posterior chain to the anterior chain, we're able to mitigate a lot of those injury risks. So it's a conversation of sports spe- specialization and early specialization in the sport that we're trying to uh, mitigate. Yeah, Mike and I had the pleasure of um, going out to Colorado Springs a couple of weeks ago to attend a U.S. Olympic Committee meeting of all sports where, yeah, there's there's a pervasive problem across all sports right now with early specialization. So, you know, and it's impacting sport participation, you know, the athlete's experience, and it's ultimately inhibiting, you know, the athlete's career um, performance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the conversation all sports is having is how do we prevent that? And luckily, Mike and I are part of the conversation with U.S. Sailing um, to help, you know, translate that message specifically for our sport. And, you know, it's it's difficult in the sense that, uh, you know, sailing mm-hmm. is a sport that re- innately requires a lot of travel. And um, it's kind of like a unique sport to get into in the beginning. But, you know, our message for our younger athletes is to make sure that, you know, they're enjoying multiple mm-hmm. sports and that, you know, whatever, you know, there's this idea in in sailing where, you know, if your kid isn't the top dog by the age of 15, then he's not going to make it to the Olympics. And what we see time and time again is it's actually the kid that's always been, you know, good and, and close to the podium and, and stays with it and has like a more um, comprehensive sport experience is the one that ultimately wins the medals um, in sailing here. So we are, mm-hmm. you know, with our older athletes, um, the elite athletes we're currently working with, you know, it's, we're trying to mitigate, you know, the mm-hmm. early specialization experiences that they may have had and trying to balance that out. And then, you know, with our younger athletes, it's really driving home the message of, you know, we need to make sure that you have all these other non sailing skills developed so that your goal 10 years from now um, can be achieved. Mm-hmm. And it's, Great to hear that you all are encouraging, especially the youth athletes, to play other sports. We always, t- I was a tennis player, we always talked about the most durable being the best uh, long term on the court, right? So the, the athlete that had the, I guess, the broadest range of athleticism can actually perform at the highest level of a particular sport, you know, down the line. Um, so I'm curious to also hear how that's played into the training regime of, of younger athletes, how you're uh, focused on, you know, one particular sport, but if you have a youth athlete, you know, they're at 
the maybe high school or pre-high school level, you know, how are you working around the other developmental kind of techniques and training that they're doing, say, in soccer practice or in tennis? Or, I mean, are, are they also participating in, in other kind of club, maybe sports um, at that young age? So for our youth athletes, the the key to success for me as a coach and helping them reach their full potential Mm -hmm. is to do a really good job of Mm -hmm. assessing where they currently stand in the developmental pathway of of, of, uh, performance of of physical literacy. So looking at a 14 year old male versus a 14 year old female, they may be at very different developmental ages or stages of growth um, from each other just based on sex, based on hormones, based on um, what previous sports they played, how they've developed, uh, those certain aspects. So that the adolescence age where we're really growing as a human um, and lots are changing, uh, that's a really important time to assess and continue to assess on. We, we, we test on a quarterly basis uh, to understand where their strengths and weaknesses are and where are the imbalances in terms of developmental um, ath- athlete development. Uh, and from that, we can really do a good job of saying, hey, you're, you're lacking some overall speed and agility. Um, your suppleness is not very good. And that's something that you really should have learned two years ago. So we're going to put a big focus on it. Um, you know, through Mm -hmm. this next phase so that you can catch up to where you should be overall as a balanced athlete. Um, And we can continue to track that. We have standards for different age groups and developmental ages that we expect each of our athletes to to reach uh, as they grow as an athlete. So the assessment's a huge process uh, towards that. Um, I have Mm -hmm. high school athletes that I help determine which sports they should play. Uh, so, you know, mm-hmm. speaking with their father, speaking with their, um, you know, youth, uh, s- the school sports science team, if they have one, um, and really getting some hands-on eyes in terms of, you know, okay, this person should play water polo for a season over the next four years because they're lacking in aerobic capacity at the current age. Um, and so we can, we can really help them through that process. Uh, to learn the skills that they need to at least be able to reach their full potential if they want to. Yeah. And that's how cool is that, that, you know, your, your prescription, you know, Mike's prescription is for him to go play another sport. You know, that's, that's more fun than potentially going to the gym to work out. And you know what? That's unique too, right? Because there's so many of these sports where you do have to completely devote yourself at eight, 10 years old. Right. I mean, you look at especially the individual sports. I, I certainly saw it in tennis. You see it in gymnastics. Exactly. You see it in swimming. I mean, you know, there's so many parents, coaches, et cetera, out there that that drill those into the, to the kids early and then they they die out, right? I mean, they they lose interest at 18, and that's that's not great. Um, and I'm I'm curious too. Have you ever struggled struggled with maybe parent buy in or you know how you're I don't know try, trying to uh, train the kid and, and be the, the, the kid's advocate um, while dealing with, you know, ex kind of other uh, stakeholder needs, I guess, or wants. Sure. Well, I, yes. The answer to that is yes. Um, I think it's, you know, we've, we're coming up on our one year anniversary, you know, Mike and I, we have a huge presence in the sport and uh, <laughs> we know a lot of the athletes and we've been, you know, communicating our, you know, business for some time, both with mm-hmm. athletes, parents, and coaches. And it's, you know, sometimes it takes six months to 12 months for those athletes to kind of come around to the idea of, you know, these guys might not be that wrong, you know, and they give us a try and they they see the product that we have and they really enjoy it. Um, so it's, it's for sure taking buy-in even um, at the top with, you know, some of our more elite organizations, but, um, you know, it's, it helps a ton to have, um, you know, all the sports in the U S kind of pushing this directive from the U S Olympic committee. Um, and it helps to have our national governing body, uh, pushing that as well. So it's, we're right at, we're presenting ourselves at the correct time. Um, and there is a culture shift Mm -hmm. happening both within our sport and all sports. No, it's super interesting. And it's frankly, it's great to hear it. I feel like it's about time, right? Um, (laughs) 
I, I do have kind of one last question around the youth development program. How are you all teaching these movements effectively and making sure that people are, you know, especially the younger populations who might be unfamiliar with um, like a back squat or even just you know, a, a regular body squat or whatever you're doing with the younger groups? How are you actually teaching them effectively since you're not there in person? Yeah, so that goes back to our assessment process per athlete. Um, mm-hmm. We have a movement screen mm-hmm. that we run in the beginning just to understand mm-hmm. what their movement quality is. And that's run through the Bridge Tracker app. Uh, there's videos for each of the movements that they uh, are doing or we ask them to, to complete. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they mm-hmm. send us a video back of themselves doing that movement within Bridge Tracker. And what we can do then is give mm-hmm. direct feedback during the initial consultation in terms of exactly where that athlete sits and what some of their limitations are. Um, then from, from there, they, do, they, they actually complete a two to four day test, physical test, where we test their absolute strength. Uh, they also it, video all of those movements and then do aerobic capacity work as well. So that assessment process is huge. If we didn't have that, we couldn't correctly uh, program or you know share and give an insight for that athlete what they're doing wrong. So that's where the visual uh, is super important in terms of a coaching method. Um, you know, we have two that we can do visual and by word of mouth or uh, showing the athlete uh, how to do it. Um, so, you know, we don't have that tactile cues to give. So we really do a great job of explaining in our coach notes what the process is and what we want them to achieve. And then so, so from that, from the movement screen and the initial testing, what we're able to do is, mm-hmm. is really help the athlete through correctives in terms of movement quality, mm-hmm. uh, especially if they've never been into the gym before. They don't know really what how to move weights or weight lift. And that's very common for our industry. So what what that does is, you know, we really have to be one on one with that athlete and check in frequently about progress. Um, Progress is always going to be slower remotely than it is in person. But we feel if we do a great job of communicating uh, with that athlete, they're able to still make the corrections and and movement improvements that we want to see from them. Um, So that's 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 our process. Uh, we also have curriculum that we are building to help uh, orient and educate the athlete in terms of both lifestyle aspects, nutritional aspects, and uh, from movement quality aspects in terms of how to really approach performance training uh, from a very holistic level and what does it all include. And, and a lot of it is the movement aspects, you know, how to, how to train appropriately, but there's a lot, also a lot of lifestyle, a lot of um, how to run an Olympic campaign, how to uh, eat, sleep, drink, and feel yourself well. Um, those sorts of aspects that we're training the athletes on. So we feel the education and the communication are two integral points in terms of progressing the remote athlete. Yeah, and we, we also become a resource for our athletes uh, to understand, like, you know, you need to go become comfortable with just being in a gym, right? And racking a bar and, you know, how to grab the the dumbbells and stuff like that. So it's um, part of the the homework and part of the exercises that we provide and build up to right. that stuff. Right. And, and it's all in a way where the athlete gains comfort, you know, a comfortability with like being in the gym space and then also like slowly uh, using all the equipment within it and then building on the way from there. Mm-hmm. You both teed me up so well for my next question. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> no, but I th- you know, I, I'm glad you took the time to explain that kind of process and that psychological component as well, because especially as a younger athlete, but really any athlete coming into um, a more complex gym environment for the first time. I mean, you know, I think our industry as a whole or wellness in the wellness industry, the broader industry as a whole has been so inundated and so fixated on like group training and, and body weight movement and all the stuff that's, you know, can be helpful and can be beneficial and and whatnot, but there's a lot of noise. Um, and there's a lot of then hesitation when you take that population, if they're training for something then specific where they need to learn how to, you know, rack a bar correctly, right? Like they need to know what, 
how to handle different pieces of equipment and feel confident in doing so. And especially, you know, I come at it from kind of the female perspective, but for the female athlete, like that was always something that was so intimidating. You'd go into the high school or collegiate gym and, you know, the guys, it was only men down at the weight, right? Like the, the weight section, right. And, and by the racks and that's a huge psychological barrier for a lot of people to overcome. Um, and, not that that's necessarily what I, what I want to harp it on in my question is, uh, but I, it kind of lends well into it is, uh, Fred, you mentioned in the beginning that you all have hired or are in the process of hiring um, a, um, a psychologist, a sports psychologist. And I'm curious to hear, it makes sense. I'm curious to hear the thought process around that um, and the value add that, that that person will bring to the table and, and you know why you're excited about bringing them on. Yeah, so you know, part of our presentation to um, at the coaching symposium the last month to all of our sailing elite sailing coaches was, you know, there there are studies that show, you know, when it comes to sport performance, you know, maybe a quarter of the factors um, are related exactly to deliberate sport practice, and so there's you know there's all these other factors which will influence how the athlete will ultimately perform at events and. And those are, you know, the simple stuff, social skills, you know, strength and conditioning, nutrition, um, knowing how to balance a budget, you know, for a lot of our Olympic campaigners, knowing how to fundraise. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's when Mike and I, you know, Mike and I both had the pleasure of working with Dr. Jerry May, who has been a long time uh, psychologist for, he he began with the U.S. Olympic ski team and eventually was working with um, all sports um, and the, we could see the value mm-hmm. in not only having just a psychologist to kind of like give you feedback on, um, situations, just interactions. I mean, half, half of what most of the athletes would talk about were how to interact with coaches and other athletes, you know, and how to set expectations and, and manage, you know, stress. So, um, you know, I know that's, I have a, um, psychology background, and I know mm-hmm. that's that's one mm-hmm. thing that, that really um, made me want to study that in college was, you know, I had all these questions about how to be, a, you know, a stronger person cognitively. And um, mm-hmm. I think that's a tool that all of our athletes would love to have. So what we want is, you know, what we always want to provide for our athletes is access to information and access to expert coaches, p- particularly within the sailing realm that know the sailing world, because it's also really frustrating for our athletes to have to seek out experts in other fields that have no clue about the specificity of sailing. So we want to offer that to them. And then we ultimately are going to build curriculum so that it's affordable for the athlete to take little mini courses on, you know, progressive muscle relaxation or visualization. Um, So they have the awareness, they have some of the tools and when they're ready and they need more program specificity, they have access to an expert that knows the sport that can that can lead them through that experience. Yeah, that's so cool. I'm so excited to see all that material uh, come to light because I think you know it's it's so important and it's something that still to this day I don't think we focus um, as much as we should on. So good for you guys. That'll that'll be great. Um, all right. Well, last thing that I really want to cover here, and uh, you know, I'm really interested to hear just some more of your thoughts around growing and scaling your business. You know, like I said, we've got a lot of listeners that are thinking about scaling their own businesses or going remote or, you know, kind of following this model that you all have seen such great success in, even, you know, in your first year. Did you model your business after anyone? Had you? How did you come up with the idea? I mean, I know that you both wanted to tackle the space within sailing, but you know, I'm curious to see how you kind of adapted what you wanted to do to the the confines of the space and the reality of it. Yeah, for sure. I think I think sailing is a unique sport in that uh, the challenges of the athlete mostly are geographic. Um, you know, we have athletes that will commute from New England to South Florida for a weekend of practice and then go back to school for the week and do that three um, times each month. Mm. So um, we want to make a system that's easy for them. Um, mm-hmm. and, but it's also affordable because they're spending a lot, of, a lot of money traveling for that practice. So, um, you know, we mo- I think the, I think the remote coaching space is, um, you know, it's well developed and there are a lot of really great tools out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I see a lot of companies that are focusing only on strength and conditioning. Um, and those coaches, 
those strength and conditioning coaches are trying to apply principles outside of their probably expertise, although they may be intuitively familiar with, with those topics. Mm -hmm. Um, and for us, we just, we just want to have, you know, the best coaches that we can that are experts in their field to, and we want to empower them to own their space in the sport of sailing, to become Mm -hmm. the experts in sailing. And if that leads to more sports, then, then hooray, you know, but we are really focused on, you know, having them, Mm -hmm. Uh, understand the sport, learn it and be Mm -hmm. those experts within it. That's good to hear. I'm also curious to hear if you've thought about growth and expansion at this rate. If you, you know, if you, if you're thinking about maybe going into different sports at some, somewhere down the line or, you know, how, how, where you all want to see the company develop from here? Yeah. I mean, I think we, we, we want to focus on sailing. It's always been our sport of passion. And I think if we can provide and uh, build all of the tools and resources for the for our sailing market then there's there's no reason that this couldn't be applied to other sports that have similar challenges mm-hmm. just you know difficulty in aggregating enough athletes in one space to warrant a facility you know it's like we we may mm-hmm. not be able to really um tackle sports like baseball and football where there's plenty of athletes all in one area and they can have those facilities but Maybe some of the smaller sports, they, they have these similar challenges and this may be a way for them to, to reach out to those athletes, right? Yeah. And as you, as you mentioned before, you know, the fact that we're now placing more of a positive emphasis on uh, expanding the, the young athletes realm of possibility within different sports at different seasons and whatnot, certainly it could be something cool to get into, especially at the individual level where, you know, it's skiing, swimming, tennis, like we've all mentioned, um, you don't have a lot of resources in not just strength and conditioning, but also broader performance space, psychology, nutrition, everything in between. Um, so very, very much looking forward to seeing where you guys take it from here. Uh, and so excited to work with you into 2019. Uh, I do always like to close the episode with asking some more personal questions, more about, um, you know, as your career develops, who you look to for guidance, um, you know, whether it be each other or if you have role models within the space and, and what you really learned from that. So for me, you know, I, I really look back to the great strength and conditioning coaches out there, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger or Charles Poliquin. Um, my mentor was James Fitzgerald, who runs OPEX Fitness, uh, which is kind of in the str- mm-hmm. CrossFit realm of training. And, um, you know, I also look to other sport specific coaches out there. There's a ton of great strength and conditioning coaches that are in the same mindset. um, Like we saw in Colorado Springs last week with the USOC meeting, everybody's in this space Mm -hmm. and we're all learning it together. So, you know, really Mm -hmm. it's an exciting time to, to be in the industry. And, and um, you know, we look at a, a ton of different coaches and opportunities to learn how to do this best. I mean, we're uh, as equally as naive as as and, and humble to kind of be in this space um, because we the growth of it is is uh, there's a ton of potential and and we're really excited for that. Um, as the business grows, I find myself kind of looking more at manager roles and how different businesses work. Mm-hmm. Um, so I look up to different kind of sporting organizations, uh, for instance, like the New Zealand All Blacks, how they create culture within their mm-hmm. system, um, how, they, how they create a culture or a kind of a theology behind their athletes and, and you know, how, how, to, how to create that culture shift uh, in our sport is, is a really big question. So, you know, I continually find myself looking at those uh, bigger sport organizations that have done it really well. And how can we model some aspects from that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Fred? Yeah, Mike and I share that, um, that desire to, to build a good culture, you know, and that's, that's part of what our company goal is. And, you know, we want to build a community of athletes that are, you know, it's, it's almost like a space for our athletes to develop and have a, have a space for um, mm-hmm. being inquisitive and trying new things um, outside of the actual competition, you know? So 
I know that when, you know, I've worked with a ton of great coaches um, and the best are those that taught me the skills and knowledge that didn't directly make my boat go faster. You know, they, mm -hmm. they were indeed very technical and knowledgeable mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. uh, the sport, but they also taught me a lot of things um, and gave me messages, um, pearls of wisdom that were unique and, and different and made me see the bigger picture of, you know, it's not just about winning this event. You know, what is the long-term play? How can I, you know, become a, a stronger competitor by learning a skill that, you know, has nothing to do with sailing. So it's those coaches that have pushed me outside of um, the sailing technical development realm that have really um, spoken to me and that I tend to stay mm -hmm. in touch with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, both great answers. And lastly, uh, often the more challenging question is what's been your, your greatest accomplishment in your career thus far? I'd say as a, as a coach, it's, it's been that transition from an athlete to a coach that has been a very fulfilling mm -hmm. process for me. Um, you know, kind of developing a personal as well as a business style and, and it goes kind of goes back mm -hmm. to that culture but developing that one-on-one -on -one relationship you know coach athlete relationship um, where there's so much trust mm -hmm. there's so much uh openness and and really we're able to to dig down at a deeper level like how do we be better human beings and how can we share that with each other and you know that that growth for me is like above the all the all the great business growth we've had it's those one-on-one -on -one conversations that just keep me going so for me it's like i cre i was able to create with with fred uh, a, a business where i'm able to express myself as a coach and, and have great relationships with other athletes um so for me that's my biggest achievement so far yeah yeah i echo mike on that one you know being able to you know, work with Mike again, you know, from Olympic sailing now as a, as a lifetime business partner, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be really fun, uh, tackling all these challenges and, uh, collaborating both with the athletes and the coaches and all these organizations to, I think, really change the face of our sport and, uh, make it better. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would definitely say you guys make an ideal team, uh, and, and definitely a great representation of what the, the sport can really breed in the long term. Um, so thank you both, Mike, Fred, for joining me today. Uh, it's been an absolutely delightful uh, time, and, and I'm really excited to get this episode launched. I'll, I'll send out some more information about Mike and Fred so you can connect with them with any questions or if you want to check out Sailing Performance Training. Uh, thank you both, Mike, Fred, for joining me today and look forward to seeing where it goes you, in 2019. Maya. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Maya. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Powering Performance. If you like our show, please leave us a five-star review wherever you're tuning in from and look out for our next episode soon. See you next time.